Before getting stuck into the Zap to the Past podcast, please accept our apologies. The audio quality on this episode only is a little bit lacking, and that's because the microphone was damaged when we recorded it. We've done our best to clean up the audio, and we hope it doesn't mire your enjoyment, but it won't happen again. Also, sometimes we refer to an episode zero. What is episode zero? That was the pilot episode of the podcast. That's something that we talk about in these episodes, but has yet to be released, and we intend to release that episode in the future. Until then, enjoy episode one of Zap to the Past. Hello and welcome to episode one of Zapped to the Past. My name is Adrian Mills and I am joined as ever by my good friend and co-host Graham Raddings. In case you don't know, this is a podcast that focuses primarily on games that were released for the Commodore 64, but we're also going to take a brief look at what was going on in the UK back in the 1980s. There were thousands of games released for the Commodore 64, so to bring order to this chaos, we are using the magazine Zap64 as a monthly guide for the games to focus on. Just one last thing regarding that though, I'd hasten to add that we are in no way affiliated with the magazine Zap64 itself. So what was Zap64? Just so uh, to give a brief bit of history to that. It was the sister magazine to the Spectrum Focused Crash and was something of a sea change in homegrown magazines when it launched in May 1985. It did away with long, dull typing games and brought a more personality focused level of coverage to the Commodore 64 scene. For myself and friends, it quickly replaced magazines like Computer and Video Games and Commodore User as the go to place for definitive reviews, previews, news, and all things Commodore 64. Mm. One last thing, please to note, is that there are a couple of swear words that do crop up every now and again. We're not the sweariest of podcasts, I have to say, but there is the old little one that does slip through in the heat of the moment. It's nothing major, but if it is an issue, then obviously please be warned that the odd one will slip through. So, in this episode, we'll be looking at the games reviewed in the first issue of Zap64, which was the rather dull and wet month of May 1985. Graham, what exactly can we expect in this episode? In today's episode, we're going to take a look at Elite, decide whether it's just a load of empty space. We're going to look at Airwolf and Pole Position. We're also going to dive into Turn and Og, see if it's worth turning it on or turning it off. And we even look at the Eurovision Song Contest and whether Bobby Sox should have been the winner. All of that to come. Um, yeah, so Zap did actually launch with... Uh, a relatively big game review. This was uh, a huge title across numerous platforms, um, so much so that it, it made made the cover. It was their cover game. Um, it's you know we could go on about covers for Zap sixty four. You know, great late great Oliver Frey, who, who did you know some incredible artwork throughout the um, uh, throughout the series. You know, throughout Zap on Crash and uh, Amtix and, and all the magazines that um, that ran for out of, out of there. Uh, was it Newsfield? It was Newsfield that did that, wasn't it? Yeah, Newsfield. Um, and and it, uh, and you know, it would be hard pushed to sort. Of, you know, this was a, a a great game for him to get his teeth into uh, from a from what you could actually do for it visually. And of course, we're talking about Elite. So Elite, um, one of video game sacred cows. Do we think? Yes, I think you're right. Well, at that time, it was the revered game, wasn't it? Because it had that, and it also came. It was. I mean, its legacy is odd. It came from like the BBC Micro, right? So, and uh, that was kind of its legacy. So, and that was kind of a serious computer, right? BBC Micro. It was the school computer. There was all in school, so it must have been mm, kind of had serious. A big forehead. I always thought BBC Micro. It, yeah, it was a. It was an elongated machine, wasn't it? With with clacky keys, I remember the clacky. Remember, I mean, that's kind of what we we had one in the whole school when I was when I was a nipper. Um, I don't remember playing Elite on it though. No, I so do. It just I shows you what schools knew. <laughs> <laughs> Draw line, I think was the command. Yeah, I must have done the, the old ten print, <laughs> twenty go to ten a million times. Call myself a programmer then. Well, you programmed. 
Um, so elite, elite. Um, all right, let's get this out of the way. Sort of thing. I've never been a big fan of elite. I just haven't. I find, I, I, and this is not to denigrate the technical aspects of it. You know what, Braven and Bell managed to squeeze into uh, these, you know, eight-bit machines, thirty-two K, forty-eight K, sixty-four K, whatever. It's incredible. Don't get me wrong. You know, entire galaxy, loads of planets, everything that goes into Elite. Yes, incredible. Um, but the C64 version, obviously the version we're talking about and the thing I played, just slow and a bit boring. I couldn't, just could not get, I've never been able to get on with it. Not ever. Um, and I just, it's, it's, uh, I, you know, and I feel like I'm going against the grain. You know, people, you can't talk bad about Elite, but, you know, from a gameplay point of view, it is very dull. There's just nothing really to do. It's not responsive. It's not particularly interesting. You fly from place to place. You trade in slaves. You trade in this and the yeah. It's, there's a load of freedom. I get all these things, but and this, you know, user you created stories and you know people have all these great uh, you know, anecdotes about it and yeah, that's fine. But I just I don't know. Oh, I, I don't think there's actually. I just feel there's not much game there. There's not much. There's this. I don't know how to express it. It's just lacking a hook. Yeah, I mean, the question you have to ask yourself, I suppose, when you think about it is, you mean you didn't find intergalactic <laughs> space trading interesting <laughs> at a young age? Well, space is dull. You know, trying to control something in space. And also, don't even get me started, and this will be probably to a lot of people, docking at that very first space station before you've got a docking computer. <laughs> <laughs> trying to match your rotation it's trying to match your right. rotation to that small small square that's getting bigger and bigger bigger and bigger until crash bang game over commander jameson you are dead yeah um, see i com- uh, completely agree it is classic frustration point as if starting with very little wasn't bad enough in a spaceship that's ill-equipped for space travel let alone battles you've then got to dock this thing now i would challenge anyone even right now put get an astronaut Put him in front of that game, in the front of the C64 game, and say, right, you've got a dock on that slow-moving <laughs> rectangle, which is going to speed up as it gets bigger because the because the maths is getting simpler. And then you've got to align yourself to that. It was, it was frustrating. And how many times did you crash and kill yourself doing that, thinking, right, well, I went through all the rigmarole of loading up my spaceship with, with various <laughs> spices to trade with, you know, Dizzo from my planet of Lave, <laughs> only to be destroyed trying to land. I mean, only when you get the docking computer by either hook or crook later does it become a one-button thing where it just automatically guides you. Why did it just give you that yeah, from the start? Yeah, exactly. You know, did they not watch the when, like, in Star Wars, the Millennium Falcon just glides in? You know, to the when the, the into the star destroy into the Death Star, it just glides in because they get it in a tractor beam and they pull it in. Why could they, you know they, they've already got it programmed? They've got a docking computer in there, give you that from the start, do away with so much frustration. I might even like this game because I might feel that I can actually do stuff and not have to worry about am I going to crash into this thing. In all fairness, if you're the administrator <laughs> slash um, boss <laughs> of the docking bay of a significantly proportioned space <laughs> terminal. You do not want people just flying in with no credentials, willy-nilly just crashing into your mothership and your and crashing into your dock and your docking bay and trashing the place without, you know, just give them a give them the computer. You're going to save yourself yep, thousands of absolutely. millions of dollars in bent metal costs. I mean, I'm just, I mean, I'm speaking from a, a, a you know, an insurance point of view, you know, just if you're going to operate a space station, the last thing you want is a free-for-all of people crashing into the dock. Just give them away. Give space. Look, if you want to come in, I'll give you a docking computer. Don't worry about yeah. it. And, a, and a, something that size as well is going to create a bit of centrifuge, I'd have thought. So is, I imagine sort of thing. It's going to be like Saturn's ring, but just this crash spaceship debris going around it after a while. Dude, you know. <laughs> yeah. And, and look, don't even get me started on the combat in that stupid game. Who invented a, instead of going left and right, rotating all the time? You know, rotate, you know, why would you, I mean, I know it's space and it's, you know, but, and there's this, and that's my chief complaint with this game is, is because there's a, there's a, um, a predilection in this game to kind of follow the space rules of gravity and all of those sort of things. And that's all very admirable. It's all very 2001. The problem there is it's not very exciting. You know, it's nothing worse than, I mean, if, if they actually showed a space battle of mine from that game, in like a movie like Star Wars, <laughs> they just see me spinning round, rotating endlessly, and 
I'm finding my only solace is that the planet is round enough for me mm-hmm. to focus on it for two seconds, but I've spin out of control again. And that's like, that's not exciting. And, the, and then, then I have lasers that aren't powerful enough to do any damage. It don't, it's just, it was all reputation. And it, it is a programming feat to fit a universe inside of a 32K BBC, let alone a 64K. And apparently the Commodore 64 version had added extras that they did other versions didn't have. So it was like the best version in terms of what was in it. But... I don't know, it's not for me, Elite. And even then, you know, there's been iterations and iterations and iterations of it. Vector graphics was not a Commodore 64 strong point. It just it didn't have a fast as fast a processor as the BBC in terms of its CPU capability. And it showed. In games where there was a lot of vector graphics and mathematical drawing, it showed. And it made it lag. And even back then, yeah, I just found it uh, initially, it had that kind of, wow, big galaxy that I can explore. What it is actually is a is it generally just following circles yeah, around? I, 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 I do bored. remember, you know, asking myself, was the problem me? You know, I must be missing something here. There must be something because, <laughs> you know, that, like it's Zap Gold Medal. It's got this got this reputation. It's this incredible piece of programming and this incredible game and an entire galaxy at your fingertips. And so the problem must be me. It must be me. But then, I've, you know, over the years, I've come to realize that no, the problem isn't me. The problem is just that it's just dull and it's just not for me. It's not for me. I'm not knocking it in any way, shape, or form, other than it's not for me, and I just don't get on with it. Well, they, they, I mean, they, they properly like gave it a great review in Zap, and um, and I, I just couldn't, I couldn't, I read, I went, you read the review, and it's very evangelical about it, and I just couldn't come to, I couldn't comprehend the game I played and their review, um, and so I just came to the conclusion that, um, contextually at that time, that kind of 3D must have been now and impossible outside of an arcade, um, and so on a computer, they must have been overly impressed by that, but you know, you knew that as soon as you started that game, you were going backwards and forwards from bloody Dizzo to Lave, endlessly trading in the most inane stuff, and then when you did finally get the money to trade something exciting, you got shot down by the police anyway. Bah! Bah! To Elite. <laughs> so there you go. We're not so we like to let's, <laughs> let's start let's carry on as let's you know let's start as we mean to go on okay <laughs> because yeah. next up um so that's elite um we didn't like it we didn't so Less sorry than elite <laughs> sorry i feel yeah, i do feel I bad to say it as well yeah it is because it, it does have that reputation it's it lasts you know there's elite dangerous out now and everything and people still play it and it's got this you know it's the sacred cow Onwards, onwards. Um, from uh, from the whole world to uh, a, a single piece of road and maybe some water. Uh, Spy Hunter. Spy Hunter was reviewed in this issue. The uh, the uh, C sixty four version of the arcade classic. I don't know. It's an arcade game. You know, so it's got a, it's got a good reputation, I guess. Um, C sixty four version probably not. <laughs> probably not. I don't um, know. It's, I put, you know, my comments, my notes were a rudimentary conversion with twitchy controls and a bit dull. You know, yeah. well, I, found the, I found the controls very twitchy. Yes, um, yes. You know, and, and quite hard, and I would just bounce off stuff and die, and uh, I was like, Ugh. it's okay. It's rudimentary, it, it, you know, I, I don't know, I think maybe it's just, it's okay. I, 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 I on it is a good game. I used to like playing it in the arcade sort of thing. I think the problem I had with it um, was that the uh, the aspect ratio in the arcade it's uh, very t- very long, very tall, so you could see a lot more of the rest. Yes. yes, it was. Um, so and this not so much. So yeah, you were reacting. I think, I think you're right. A bit late. Yeah, it's and a I bit squashed. That, that... <laughs> yeah, and um, you know, it's got. I mean, it, it, to be fair, it has all. The elements of the arcade game, it's, it's all there. It's, you know, it scrolls nicely. It lo- looks, it's recognizable. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like I'm yeah. dying with faint praise here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, says, it, says, it says the word spy on to when it starts. That's a good start. It, 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 it does, yeah, but I can't get excited about this conversion. Nothing about it made me go, yeah, I want to play more of this. In fact, everything about it made me, I don't want to play any more of this. So, yeah. <laughs> well, the problem with Spy Hunter, Spy Hunter is that it's Spy Hunter. So contextually, this is this is a driving game with a bit of a kind of a James Bond sort of hint. I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, you actually described the game because I haven't. So go, you go for it. 
Well, it, essentially, you you are. I'm a, from what I can gather, I mean, you're not really given much to go by. You are a guy driving a car. It looks like a kind of a Bond, James Bond style car. And but I would assume if you're a spy hunter, that would mean that you're the person who's hunting James Bond. So you you technically must be the bad guy, I think. Anyway. So you're driving a car along the road and the premise from what I can gather is to simply survive the road and to do that you have to keep ramming vehicles off the road but not the certain vehicles and um, there's certain enemy types that you can't do that to and I think that's it. I think at a certain point you change to a boat for some reason um, and then you can change back to a car. There is a nice little upgrade sort of tree where you can drive into the back of a lorry and you can pick up missiles on oil slits and stuff like that. That's the, the, As an arcade conversion in terms of the functional aspects of the arcade and what it did, they're all there. You can drive, you can get in boats, you can ram things, you can get into the vans and uh, into the lorries and get uh, an upgrade and all that kind of thing. But the trouble with the game is, as much as that simple gameplay, that's it. And it is super repetitive. And the issue with the C64 version is sparse. It's just very sparse. There's not many vehicles in it. Yeah. It's kind of, a, instead of it being a crowded, busy road where you're trying to navigate your way through lots of traffic, it's kind of like a leisurely drive in the countryside <laughs> with the occasional Vol- Volkswagen Beetle getting in your way. I mean, I've, I've driven that way. I've never ran one off the road. But the, la- yeah. the idea of hunting spies doesn't come across in the sort of jaunty, that's something that's never occurred to me. happy version. And, the, you know, there's no urgency to it. It's just kind of a, a casual drive, periodically interrupted by either a car with spikes. or, or And you can explode for no reason in that game. Yes. Um, yeah, this is more sort of uh, Roger Moore in A View to a Kill yeah, versus, yeah, the arcade yeah. ver- versus the arcade version, which is Daniel Craig in Casino Royale. Yeah, I remember the arcade game had that... Um, sit- it was a sit-down arcade, which was unusual at the time. And it had it wasn't a steering wheel. It was kind of a... Uh, if you imagine a letter M with, with ha- like a handlebar, um, the steering mm. wheel was that. So And you had an accelerator pedal in it, which was, I think, one of the first games to feature that kind of control. So the arcade had that innovative... Value, you take all that away, <laughs> and you just kind You're of left, left with, with a, a very... yeah, a pretty repetitive game, and, and yeah. the graphics are very sparse, very basic on that. For a Commodore sixty four that can display a lot more sprites than that, even at, at a mm. most basic level, without the complexity of doing some of the fancy programming that came later, they could have had more in that in that screen, and I felt that it was just a bit empty. Yeah, I think you're right, and it's never occurred to me actually that yeah. Why are you hunting spies? Yeah, you're know, the spy <laughs> See, hunter. The, right? title has, the, the title has never occurred to me. Are you the bad? It's like they say, are we the bad guys? <laughs> are we hunting James Bond? Because <laughs> James Bond doesn't hunt other spies. Yeah, and as a final note, the Peter Gunn theme, which is in that, actually emulates the arcade pretty much perfectly. It's the only thing in it that is as close to the arcade as, as most of the things I've heard, and. Um, that's not good though it's not, I'm not saying that's great because as much as it's Peter Gunn it's A repetitive and B really quiet in the background the engine sounds and the skid sounds of the vehicles are, aren't good so you know as much as it's got these token tertiary effects that Peter Gunn theme albeit inaudible almost is, uh, is straight from the arcade but well, no it's, it's, it's confused what is but... it it's not particularly complex is it anyway the bouncer is dull endless repetitive mm-hmm by hunting <laughs> no no it's it is um yeah like i said it's a rudimentary conversion it's recognizable as spy hunter but take away all the trappings of the arcade and it's actually la- lays bare that it's not that not that interesting i think so we're off to a good start and things only well do they get better i don't know probably not two for two two for <laughs> not for two really um yeah so we've got another arcade conversion coming up um and that is another car game strangely enough um and it's again a bit of another classic that made that is reviewed in this uh issue um and that is pole position you know for those who don't know pole position is based on formula one i guess um you're driving a formula one car around a track um it was a classic arcade game from atari um uh, it was very good in the arcade sort of thing nice clear crisp graphics lots of speed good sense of 3d uh sprite scaling and all that kind of thing um uh but then you have the c64 version um yeah um and if i if you and if you thought spy hunter had bad handling then then pole position basically just says hold my beer (laughs) and walks off 
Um, and awful, awful handling. Like, there's no sense of grip, physics, anything. I couldn't, I didn't know what was going on. And the cars seemingly made out of C4 because I can only, under, I, I can only think that that is the case because you touch anything and you are a ball of flame. Um, literally, the whole car is the gone sort of thing. This is literally, you know, brush a pebble, a stone, bounce off the back of another car, and your car is just a, 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 a flaming sprite. Well, that's right. Um, I mean, who gone. knew that Formula One cars were, were so uh, so um, volatile? I mean, you breathe on those things, they explode in that game, right? Yeah, it's, it's awful. And, and you know, what the, the note I've made on this, um, aside from just the word no, um, was um, <laughs> was in a world where pit stop do exist? Why would you play this? Yes, um, pa- playing um, on its that's, reputation that's, from the arcade. Yeah, um, and uh, you know, I, I quite again um, like Spy Hunter before it. Uh, the music's not a bad representation of the arcade music, um, and that's quite iconic. That stuck in my head. And I was like, I oh. when you hear that music and he starts, you're thinking, oh, this is actually going to be okay because that music instantly transitions you to the arcade version you're thinking i know that i like pole position in the arcade i've had some good plays of that um and then it starts and um you know it, it's like just someone setting that memory on fire you're exactly right again this is again another arcade conversion that relies on the fact that the original had a steering wheel and pedal and a sit down driving position take that away and you're left with driving a car with a stick which isn't easy in any capacity but even if that was something that you could look past, I, I mean, my my two words I wrote down initially were somewhat horrific, <laughs> because it's just <laughs> as an arcade conversion, all the things that you'd want out of an arcade conversion are not there. The road is inexplicably bendy. The steering doesn't seem to. It could steer itself around some of the bends, but when they went really steep, it just kind of the road didn't bend as much as kind of curve in a really weird <laughs> way. And then if you then turned your vehicle. The animation of the hugely blocky, it, and actually stupidly blocky sprite, an unnecessarily blocky sprite, really, lazy programming, really, that, um, went really sort of elongated. So, And then all of a sudden you would shoot across the track at 100 miles, like, boom, explode. I'm like, But you would come back immediately. And then obviously the, the kicker yeah. is that you start then in low gear and you have to go to high gear, which is essentially just a way of changing drone sound from annoying to really annoying. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I just, I just thought, you know, in a world where you've got pit stop to, as you rightly point out, why on earth would anybody in their right mind pay money for that? And I think the retail was well over six or seven pounds at this point, which is a lot of money back then. Yep. Yeah, dreadful. Ar- this was awful. Arcade, this was real... There's an arcade cash in at the end of the day, and sad. Sad that I mean, there was there was a lot of them at that time. Actually, there's a few. We'll, we'll, we'll no doubt come across all of these as we go through the, the Zap magazines. But this was a particularly, you know, there's two. Real doozies there, spy on and pole position, which great arcade games, not great conversions. No, no, they weren't, and it's a it's a shame sort of thing. But like I said, you know, pit stop two exists, and so what do I care about pole position? You know, that's, that's simply it. And it, you know, pit stop two showed that you could have clear, crisp car graphics, nice track, good handling, um, and everything that that entailed. And and this doesn't have any of that, and it's a like you said, I think it's a, it's an arcade cash-in grab. Airwolf is our next one, so let's move away from cars and let's move to helicopters. Um, uh, Airwolf. Um, so actually, we're, yeah, we're, we're just controlling a lot of vehicles at the moment. Oh, we've got spaceships, cars, and now helicopters. Um, so, um, Airwolf was, uh, for those who don't know, was is a it's not a conversion, but it's a, it's a TV uh, show from the 1980s in which uh, a man called Stringfellow Hawk uh, flew a prototype helicopter um, in you know a week to week serial, went on adventures, rescued people um, from missions given him by a guy called Archangel, if I remember rightly. Um, while whilst um, uh, Ernest Borgnine just smiled from the sidelines. So Do- that's Dominic Santini you're referring to there. So, Dominic Santini, <laughs> sorry. That's his character uh, name, Dominic Santini. I love these names: Stringfellow Hawk, Dominic Santini, and Archangel. <laughs> they were they were on fire whenever they wrote that. Um, so yeah, so 
uh, you know, they would they would go off, they would fly around, maybe shoot some stuff, rescue people and do whatever sort of thing. Week-to-week -week serial adventures, a la Blue Thunder, A-Team, Knight Rider, whole slew of these that came through in the 80s. Airwolf the game. I don't remember Airwolf being in a caves with bouncing faces. <laughs> There was a. I don't remember that from the TV a, show. I must have missed that episode. <laughs> it was that when Stringfellow drank from the wrong bottle that time, and Archangel said, "Not that bottle, not that bottle." <laughs> oh no, no. Uh, right. So this is Airwolf the hallucination. Exactly. Yeah, no. For next for the next two hours, Stringfellow, don't fly a helicopter, mate, because you are going to see things. <laughs> It was like it was like. And, a, well, you're going to see the same. You're going to see the same little bit of cave over and over while you try yeah. and control this helicopter. Yeah. That is an absolute nightmare. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Which suffers so, from a mad just, problem. Uh, it, <laughs> go on. It's, well, it suffers from a, a serious technical flaw in that it can't hover. All helicopters can hover as far as I'm aware, but not that one. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. No. This was. I don't know. Yeah, and so. You have you, the game starts you off in a very you, you're quite a large sprite and the airwolf sprite is actually quite nice. I'll give it that. The airwolf sprite is all right, okay. And similar, I thought this was a bit of an evolution of Choplifter that we talked about last time, um, in that your your helicopter could face left, face right, and face on sort of thing. So you could drop bombs and you could shoot left, right, and center, and you, you have to fly around. So the game starts you off and it's very you're quite a chunky sprite, not chunky as in chunky, but a fairly big sprite, and you're in this very very tight cave area. Um, where this, for some reason, this object is pinging between three mag magnets. I don't know what they were, like, or pinball bumpers or something, for no reason. And so you have to get in a particular place to shoot this object. I could only fire, I could only get it if I went over to the other side, turned left, hoping I didn't fly into anything, and then I could manage to shoot it. That opened a door, um, but only, the door was only open very very narrow not much bigger than you so the twitchy controls the fact you can't hover made it very hard to get through that door if you got through that door you were faced with i think if i remember a brick wall you had to shoot your way through this brick wall and then what looked like the liquor sprites from iridis alpha um these faces were just floating around and by this point you were dead <laughs> and they were back to the and you were back to the title screen and had to do all that again and I'd sad to say I didn't get any further because it's the, uh, what were they what what when they drew up the design document for this when that's the episode of Airwolf we're going to base this on. You, I mean, instead of made, if they'd have made this a version of Choplifter, I could have probably got behind it um, because Airwolf rescuing people, flying around, shooting stuff, da -da -da, Choplifter. I can get, I can see that. I can, I, I applaud their their wanting to do something different but airwolf's adventures in caves is not what i wanted yeah and, and as a final note yeah it was and as a final note just one one thing i had was that uh, the music which was airwolf was really famous for its main tv music score it was a really great theme tune it was a really oddly jaunty version in the game it kind of felt like you know steel ice span had got hold of it and gone oh we'll record that for you don't you worry about that and come up with this kind of hey nonny nonny version of the Airwolf theme, and I know there was many Airwolf themes that came out in different ways at that time from different composers as part of the whole kind of C64 demo thing, which we'll cover in many episodes' time. But suffice to say, it wasn't a great version of the theme, which is odd because it's it's almost built for synthesizers like the like the 60, C64 could have emulated. It could have done so much better with that. So uh, this is not going well. <laughs> we haven't played a good game yet. <laughs> Or, or a game that, or a game that we've enjoyed, um, is that going, is that going to change? I don't know. Is this going to change? Maybe I don't know. Let's see. What did you think to uh, our next game? So we've got a couple more before we go for a break. Um, if you're wondering why we're covering these games, uh, they, they got high review scores, so we're covering them. These are the big hitters. We're not got to the bad games yet. Um, <laughs> so stay, stay with us. <laughs> stay with us um, because it only goes downhill. <laughs> or maybe go uphill. Who knows? Um, so our next game is uh, Shadowfire. Shadowfire, uh, made by, uh, released by uh, Beyond Software, designed by Denton Designs, I think it was at the time, um, is a is an is an odd game. It's a, a 
it's a, in in some ways but quite quite ahead of its time. It's icon based, icon driven, um, sort of turn based strategy thing um, where you control a team of sort of intergalactic adventurers and you have to equip them with various um, uh, equip equip them with equipment, uh, laser blasters, and all kinds of things. Um, and control them through a space station through these um, through these icons, and this was unheard of back then. You know, icons you know weren't weren't a thing in computing, um, not really, not at this point in time. Especially, and they weren't in games. Really. I can think of very few uh, games that use this, even over the period of time that the C64 went on. Um, and it's it's really unusual and it boots up and it has some really unusual options the first thing that springs to mind i mean first thing that springs to mind is a, a really good music um fred gray i think it was um and you can tell it's fred gray i think um it sounds like mission ad um very very similar style to his piece of mission ad and, and really good music so from the from the get-go there's a nice atmosphere about it it looks great the visuals are, are really nice um they they you know they look swish they look unusual for the for the time it's got a really unusual look to it. Um, it opens up with a load of options, which include keys, normal joystick, also an analog joystick and a light pen. Which I thought was weird. Um, you know, this is I can I can I can see that a light pen would have been really good for this game. Really good because um, the the everything about it looks great, but controlling it with a joystick is where it falls down. It it's it's a great idea that I think is ahead of its time. Um, it's, this would be great on something like the Game Boy Advance, oh, sorry, on the DS with its touchscreen. It'd be awesome. You know, this game would be brilliant because you could flip between those menus really quick and there's probably loads of games that do this. But, but, you know, we're talking 1985 here and I don't think the technology, I imagine a light pen where you could tap them would have been really good, but it was just so fiddly to do anything. Um, and I went and hunted down the, um, the manual online and sort of, had a look at what the controls were and what all the icons meant and tried to follow it through and it actually gives you a step-by-step -step guide of how to get into it and even then it was like this is just far too fiddly maybe in 1985 i'd have had the time to really stick with it um but as it is right now you know going to the going back going forward going to get just menu to menu it, it, with a joystick from icon to icon it just killed the pace um which had been set up with this lovely visual design and great music but the actual controls just it killed it dead um, which is a real shame because I really, really want to end up like this. Because uh, I think it's, it, I think it really stands out. It's the stand, one of the standout games we'll talk about today. I think um, just from the way it looks and what it's trying to do, but it just, I just, oh, that, that interface. Yeah, I think I think you're exactly right. I mean, um, I found the game a bit impenetrable because of that. Um, it, it's amazing to look at for its time. Very colourful, very pretty graphics. Um, it was really great music. It was very different to anything else, um, which is always something I admire, you know, because it's the arcade conversions and the things that we've looked at so far, albeit with the exception of, you know, there was a licensed tie-in, a couple of arcade conversions and a, an intergalactic space game, but, you know, which, 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 which we've covered. Um, Shadowfire is different to them. It looks different. It plays differently. It is kind of, you know, Windows icons and menus driven, and that is really unusual for someone almost it's a turn-based sort of adventure game and so it's a sort of the next logical step from a text adventure and a, that kind of graphic adventure and where you're managing a team and you've got the resources and everything else and if you like that kind of game and you're willing to persevere with the control system and you put in the time that it would take um i imagine you probably get a lot more out of it than i did i just found it pretty but a bit impenetrable bearing in mind that um, I had no idea what I was doing, so and I did try and look at the look up the same as you. I looked up the the uh, instructions as they were. I got a flavour of what you were meant to do, but I have to say that kind of character control adventure type games they just bore me generally. Uh, I'm not a fan of that kind of game, so I'm I'm not willing to put in the extra time it takes to persevere with something. Um, you know, and I, so I'd, I've never really got on with games, and there's, there'll be loads more games that we cover that sort of resemble shadow fire as we as we go on there's a few games that that sort of start to lean into that and in, in the end actually if you look at the kind of the sort of tra the trajectory of where those games go you end up at things like command and conquer and things like that further down the line many years down the line but a, an initial game of this time it's very unusual it is pretty 
it's impenetrable to somebody anyway, a little bit, without the without the willingness to put in the time and investment. But also, you have to really like that kind of game, and it's it, no criticism to the people who made it because it's a big game um, in terms of its scope. It just wasn't for me. But that said, I, I love the graphics on that. I, I, I'm a sucker for a really nice drawn pixel graphics, and it did have that. It, it's got that in, in Bucket, so. It's certainly better than the previous four games by a mile. Later down the line, when we start to look at the Lucasfilm games for the C64, where they used the Scrum adventure system, um, where the formula for that kind of point and click becomes very, very clear, at this point, um, it, they're just missing one element, which is kind of that graphical sort of window at the top where you can see the characters doing stuff. Um, you know, if they'd have added, if you imagine Shadowfire with that, it would have been a wholly different experience and probably a lot higher rated than it is. Well, I think that's the sequel, isn't it? Enigma Force. Well, yeah, well, we'll come to that. We will come to that. But I also think as well that the, you hit on a good point there, sort of thing, in the fact of the the Lucasfilm games, I mean, they allowed you time to sort of, the interface felt, okay, it's a bit, a bit slow, a bit clunky. This gives you 100 minutes. There's a timer clock counting down from the get go. As soon as you start, the clock going down. Uh, from 99 minutes and in, in 59 seconds, and it's going down all the time, which, yes, adds pace, I think, but when the interface is so clunky, you feel like you're fighting, you're, you're not being able to do stuff fast enough. And I think that if if, they, if you'd have had a bit more time and it maybe it'd have been properly turn-based, like, okay, plan your move, and now it happens, I'd have felt it would have, I think it would have worked better. No, I agree. It's an, interesting, it's, an interesting exper- it's an interesting experiment, and I think it's worth a look because you may really get on yeah, with it. Yeah, and the music is but, great in yeah. that game. It is. It's Fred and Gray doing what Fred is. Gray does. It's, it's a classic. Yeah. Yeah, presentationally, it's, it's, it's the best of the bunch so far by a, by a country mile. From the highs of Shadowfire to the... Uh, Trudgery of Turnanog. I think trudgery is a good word. Um, uh, I'll just read my notes because I think that this was, I think this, this speaks to it, but awkward and bewildering. Uh, <laughs> Which is not a review kept, you ever want. Kept, right? <laughs> no, kept getting killed by a monkey. <laughs> nice main character, but cool. Um, Turnanog. Yes. Tenonog is a okay. It's uh, an, an old style arcade adventure, should we say? You um, you control this with the most awkward control systems <laughs> known to man. I don't know why they like. I've no idea why they chose it. We'll come to this in a minute. But it's a terrible, terrible control system. And what you can do is um, you see your character, the titular. I don't know what he's called. If he's called Mister Tenonog, I know. Is it Mister? Is Noggy. it Mister Nog? <laughs> Oh, he's noggy. <laughs> I don't know. What's, it? <laughs> what's his name? I don't know. Mr. Has he got one? M- Mr. Nanog? Well, t- no, Ternanog's a place. Yeah. Oh, is it? Sort of thing. So what's his uh, name? I don't know. Um, oh, is it Cook? K- 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 he's Cook K- yeah, or something, something like that. I think something like that. Anyway, you, you control this guy. This um, Basically, this looks like someone who sort of plays in um, uh, what they call Man of War. <laughs> uh, or, or something like that. So this is a character that plays in some dodgy metal band um, who's got no top on, just some black trousers and long hair. I think we've met a few um, people And you control, him, <laughs> you control him um, with this awkward control system and you can you can walk left, or you can walk right one step, or you can set it to auto walk. You can flip the screen left 90 degrees each way um, to, to reveal things in the background or things in the... And, you know, as a mapping exercise, it's, it's, I don't know, I felt like uh, you know, I'd need a brain like Escher to try and get my head around this. Um, because I, c- I couldn't, I couldn't, it was so bewildering. I was just, it, and then every now and again, sort of thing, it just, it just kept coming up with some Celtic word up on the thing. And then the monkey appeared and killed me. I did pick up an axe at one point and try to attack it, but the attack animation was so slow. And I just stood there with an axe held out for a time, and then the monkey walked past it and killed me again. I had no idea what I was get what was going on. Um, supposedly, it told me that I had to find these five artifacts, which I went off to find down these bewildering series of of, of lanes to walk along. Um, and and to come to the control system, the control system, if I remember rightly, gives you multiple keys to use. But you've got two. You've got some options. You've got you've got A and S. I think is walk left and right. Z and X is spin the camera around. Um, and Q and W is 
use and drop, I think. And, and then you can you can pick up more than one items and use the number key for that. So... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the sound of exasperation. Okay. Oh. Yeah. The, turn, turn and no. <laughs> that's it. That's all I can say yes. about this. It's just... It's well animated. It gives, gives that sort of thing. It shows its Spectrum heritage. It looks like a Spectrum game. Um, you know, it's very very sparse in its colours. Um, you know, you're, it's either yellow or green or blue background with with black outline for the for the sprites so it, it definitely shows it's you know it's minimal use of trying to avoid color clash on the spectrum it shows its heritage in that respect um but it's, i don't know people probably obviously liked it at the time sort of thing but but going back to it now it's awkward controls it's it's bewildering interface it's it, it's you know all all over the place mapping which probably at the time was probably quite clever but now it's just i, I couldn't no no not for no. me no it, it really was, wasn't. It, if it you was didn't get turn it from on that. no. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. The chief yeah. problem I felt with this for me um, was this was clearly a, a a Spectrum, a Sinclair Spectrum port done because it was on the Spectrum and therefore you needed a Commodore sixty four version. It was revered and well loved on the Sinclair Spectrum because it you know and in essence the game is a an enormous um, you know find the stuff adventure. Um, and there's, there was a lot of games of that type on the Sinclair Spectrum. Find the stuff, you know. Even if you look at things like Saber Wolf and Attic Attack, and they're not in any of the. There's a, a number of games where you've just got to wander around, going left and right, or in this case, left and right, up, down. Who knows what direction you were going? Because it's impossible to know. <laughs> um, and just finding stuff, and then piecing the stuff together, and then that stuff would, once you piece it together, would reveal more stuff. And hey, presto, you know, you've won the game somehow. My problem with it was that I. I already lost interest within the first 10 minutes of the first walk um yeah great it is it great animation it just felt like i was looking at a really bad sinclair spectrum port on a commodore 64 we're knowing full well that the commodore 64 is graphically and orally and in every other way more capable than a than a sinclair spectrum i know it's a controversial point but it is it's got more memory there's no denying that and it's got a graphic chip and a sound chip that can do stuff the zx z80 powered Sinclair Spectrum, while it had its merits, didn't have those things. And so this game could have been something completely different. But instead, they just literally made a screen-for-screen port of a, of a Spectrum game badly. And even the parallax scrolling, which is there, it's juddery, it's ineffective. It's because it's a port, you know. I mean, it's almost a screen-for-screen port. And, and I found that quite difficult to, to, to comprehend when you look at the kind of colourful graphics in a game like Shadowfire and some of the other games, albeit that Airwolf might have not been a great game, the graphics were quite good. Um, so there's the capacity to have good graphics in a game. It didn't have to be this kind of monaural blue, black, yellow, black, green, black, bi-coloured backgrounds and, you know, monochromatic styles. Um, and the sound effects in it were kind of token pings and pongs and there was nothing really to draw me into this game. And if you're going to take me on an enormous adventure, and I can only assume that this, if it's Turn and Nog, which is kind of a, uh, an, I think it's an almost Irish sort of Celtic folk, I hate to say it's Irish and Celtic, but kind of folklore kind of place. Um, and I only know that because it's mentioned very briefly in the film Titanic before uh, the woman and the two children drown. And she's... Is that when they go down to the uh, the no, Irish... No, they go to... Um, <laughs> you want floor. a real party, you come to the Irish party. No, not that bit. <laughs> don't, don't do that. <laughs> the Irish, not that part, no. <laughs> Although they do speak in that kind of way. Ironically, it's they the do, yes. uh, mother from the Terminator Two movies who gets who kills the guy with the milk carton in a different role. Obviously, she's not the inexplicably time travelled into the Titanic <laughs> and uh, talking to her two kids because obviously they're trapped in the deerage section and it's flooding and that's Titanic. But the long and the short of it was that she, that's how I know that Tiernanog is some kind of mythical place for Irish people, or at least some people who believe in Tiernanog. How that ties into this game, I don't know. I didn't get that far into it because I just kept... I couldn't stop him walking left. For, for seemingly, I just couldn't... I couldn't turn right. I felt, I felt like it, I couldn't go right. I just wanted, All I wanted to do for 10 minutes was go right, and that guy was going left. And so and he just went left, and he went left, and I felt like I, at one point I thought I turned around but I think what I've done is actually just turned the camera round, but I was still going left. And it was it was a well-animated left, but it was just left. And I was like, you know what? I I'll, I want to go right, and this game's not for me. When you, when you, comp- <laughs> no, when you, when you compare this um, to 
if they'd have taken this and played to the, to the, to the C64 strength, this could have been, you know, if you take something like this and then put it in the Impossible Mission engine um, with that character, you know, you could have had that you know, and, and actually control it with a joystick. You know, we have joysticks as standard on the C64, turning left, right, jumping, so we could do all that. These things can be done, um, you know, and, and I think that that would have made it, well, well it would have made it, it better. It, it, it <laughs> would have made it controllable. It. And I would argue, you know, we last time we in the, in the podcast Zero, which will come out eventually, we spoke about the fact that that guy in Mission Impossible, uh, sorry, Impossible Mission, um, just somersaulted everywhere. I would have happily, happily had the guy turning on <laughs> yeah. somersault. It would have just been a light relief from the pleasurely walk he was on, endlessly going wherever yeah. he was going and doing whatever he was doing. Or, or, the, or the showing an well, axe to a monkey. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I can't believe you managed to pick something up. And I, I walked past that many objects thinking, pick that up. I want, p- pick, oh. This Q, I think. Yeah, I, Q, tried, I tried it all. In the and end, then, I reached frustration point max. It's, it's, it's funny because basically if you do it, you, you just lean forward with an axe and the monkey casually strolls past it and you're dead. I am pretty sure in the annals of mythic Celtic folklore, monkeys don't feature heavily in it. I'm pretty sure of that. No. I reckon, I'm wondering something whether I press the present app. Oh, show button. monkey. Because it certainly, want, well, it certainly wasn't the attack. Can you imagine if it was a text-based adventure? It would be, a monkey has surprised you. <laughs> <laughs> show the monkey the axe. The monkey has beaten you. <laughs> <laughs> show axe to monkey. <laughs> Monkey ignores Axe, <laughs> you are dead. Exactly. So, you know, decontextualize the game and put it in another frame. It ain't going to work, is it? It's turn on nothing. It's rubbish. No. Yeah. Turn it off. Turn on no. I think, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're right. So well, we are... Uh, okay, that's part one of our uh, look at those games. These all... Like, these these reviewed highly in Zap. Yeah. I'm what very did t- sorry. Did, was t- 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 turn on... Was it, was it a Sizzler or something? Oh, my gosh. It was a oh Sizzler, as far as I can... Let me just have a check. Oh, jet. my gosh. Uh, Ternanog was indeed a Sizzler. You know what? They must have been on a ha- having something happy that day. I mean... Yeah. Um, for those who don't know, if we mentioned these terminology sort of things, Zap had a rating system. If you if it was the best, I think he got a gold medal, which was it's like, you know, you have to play this. Uh, Elite got the gold medal that, that month. Um, Sizzler was something that got something between sort of 80%, you know, because they scored games out of 100%. 80 to 95 or something like that and that was like you really should go play this and then they had some of the things that got I think under 40% or 35 and they were called tackies um, we'll come to them we'll come to them later um, I think I think that's gonna that's it for part one um, <laughs> uh, yeah we'll hopefully pick up some maybe we've got we've got more games to play um, including uh, the classic Tim Loves Cricket uh, so stay around for that um, and I, that you didn't you didn't hear right that is Tim loves cricket that's coming up in part two um, so we'll see you soon. All right, okay, welcome back. So uh, that's after part one. We're going to um, this small interstitial section, um, and we're going to just, just quickly cover what was going on in the world in in May nineteen eighty five. Um, primarily to do with the UK and, and what was going on in the news and anything sort of noteworthy. Um, and I will give you a warning. This is not happy. Um, um, so it seemed like the world of football was... Uh, yeah, well... Um, uh, but let's let's start sort of thing. May 4th, we had the 30th Eurovision Song Contest. You know, everyone likes Eurovision. Uh, and it was won by Sweden, uh, by the Bobby Sox. Um, oh no, it was in Sweden, sorry. Sorry, it was in Sweden. It was won by Bobby, Bobby Sock's song La Det Swing for Norway. If you're going to win the Eurovision Song Contest in 1985, you're going to win it with that. <laughs> Norway as well. Was it in Norway? Did Norway win? No, it was in Sweden and Norway won. Goodness me. They were always the rank outsiders. Where, did, where we came in that one. Probably, I don't know. Probably 19, last. We didn't do very well after. Was it Books Fizz the last time? Well, no, we won with uh, Katrina in the Waves, didn't we? That year? We did win with Katrina in the Waves, yeah, many years later. Um, well, so football. Football we had a very bad month. Um, <clears throat> there was many um, things. There was the, for those who remember, sort of thing, and, and obviously, you know, some people may remember this uh, very badly, sort of thing. There was the 56 people were killed in the Bradford City Stadium fire. 
Um, 40 year old boy was killed at, uh, same day in Leeds United football hooligans right at Birmingham City um, this was in the middle of May um, it, there's not, I'm not going to comment on these sort of things this, this is what was going on it's like this kickstarted a lot of changes within um, football and everything like that so you know think of what you want and then just to further compound um, tragedy in the football and world sort of thing on the 29th of May uh, there was the Heysel Stadium disaster uh, the European Cup final between uh, Liverpool and Juventus, where 39 football fans were died when a, a wall collapsed. So this was not good. You know, this is to put it bluntly, sort of thing. This was a horrific, horrific series of events um, that changed a lot within football stadiums and, and, and would, you know, further compounded when Hillsborough happened, sort of thing. So uh, this this is the time the, the 1980s were, where public safety was not, you know, the thing that it is now. We we look at things now and things that we do seem a lot more safer, but. Back then, it was, it was you know, probably not the case, but I, I'm, I'm not here to lay blame. I'm not here to talk about those. That's what was going on. Oh, it just changed to, football to, forever, right? I mean, you it, know, we, it we, did. All, we all it, go on about it, but it, I think it changed the way that football matches were run and the way they were the way they were manned by fans and they changed the dynamic of that that relationship or for all time. It remains to this day changed, doesn't it? So. It does, yeah. Um, and as if that weren't bad enough, scientists, um, they announced the discovery of the hole in the ozone layer. Yeah, that was always a bleak moment, wasn't it? And then it was yeah. like, you're to blame. You, you've used too many air fresheners and too many, you know, CFC products. Yeah. So for bizarre. those who don't know, the, in the 1980s, we we had a we had a penchant for using um, hairspray and deodorant that came in cans that had uh, chloro chlorofluorocarbons. I think were the CFCs, um, and they were great. They kept you smelling fresh. They kept your hair nice and stiff. Um, but the problem was sort of thing is that they, they ate away at the ozone layer, which is a very important layer around the atmosphere of the Earth that blocks out the sun's rays, and a huge hole was found um, over the Arctic, I think it was. Um, and so, you know, just like we're experiencing now with global warming and everything and the climate crisis we are in at the moment, this was the first, probably the first, you know, one of the first big things to sort of bring that to people's attention. It was a huge, huge story sort of thing. There was this huge... Thing and, and it led to the essentially the banning of chlorofluorocarbons. I think they were used in also during the back of they were used in fridges as well, weren't they? If I remember rightly, yeah, there was there were it was used in certain gases, it was used in certain packaging, even. Um, you know, there was there was um styrofoam which was used by at that time in a lot of coffee cups and burger containers and all that kind of thing. That that was produced with the same somehow produced with the same chemicals, and so that all had to change in order to reduce the size of the hole in the ozone layer, which I believe at the time we were told was the size of Australia or something like, I remember it being the size of equivalent to some massive country and everyone going, oh my gosh, that's, I don't know what it actually is, but a hole in something sounds bad, sounds really bad, you know, you don't want a hole in the ozone layer, no one wants a hole in anything, but a hole in the ozone layer, goodness. Yeah, it was a, it was a very big deal and I, and I, and I, I do believe it's, is it still there? Is it, is it gone now? Is it, well, sorted that's it? the mystery, is it regrown? I think they, I don't know if it's shrunk, I suppose. You know, what we could do is at some point is look it up and find out. <laughs> we um, could do. That would mean <laughs> research. I just looked at what happened in the 80s, in May 85, and it told me this happened, and that was well, the end of my it, job. It, it, hasn't made, uh, it hasn't made any news headlines recently, the ozone layer. It's been superseded by climate change, and I think it's just, essentially, I think you're right. It was actually the very first indication that we had that the things that we did on the planet had a global impact on the environment that we were at that time completely oblivious to and the fact that we were pumping all of the gases and everything else and using deodorants like crazy folk um had, had somehow created this hole in the ozone and for the first time the human race was accountable for something that was damaging the planet on mass and you know it made headlines because of that and you know and things had to change and they did but it must have made a difference. I mean, it, it probably hasn't in the great scheme of things because for every, you know, tr for every CFC uh, aerosol that we managed to change into some non-CFC one, you know, we, we cut down 9 million trees in the rainforest just to make up for that, so. Yeah, I blame yeah. hair metal. Well, yes, that was a lot of hairspray. Now, I suspect Los Angeles at the time in the hair metal was <laughs> single-handedly responsible. <laughs> well, why was, how the, how the hole in the ozone layer wasn't there? Yeah, that's you know, true. It, you know, it just it, migrated upwards. It was all the smog. Did you yes, block it I out? didn't notice. Yeah, they were too busy you now. But yeah, you're right. I mean, that was a lot of hairspray. That's you know, 
but yeah, and it was it was you know for the first time it was environmental news, which up to that point had been a non thing, hadn't it? There hadn't been any. We never really heard about environmental news, though. So. Not really, not to sort of actually permeate the sort of no. bigger consciousness of, of people, sort of thing. I mean, we were what 13, 12, 13 at the time, yeah. and I remember being this was a thing that was on a lot, covered a lot, and there's a lot of people talking about it and what we need to do. Um, it was a very big deal. The funny thing is, right? It, 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 in the 80s, as if we hadn't had enough doom and gloom, you know, right? We spent most of the early, like we spoke about in episode zero, in 1982 and 1983, it was all nuclear war and doom and troubles. And then to compound that even further, it's the, where well, you're destroying the ozone layer and there's you know, these deadly viruses. And, and you know, it's just this perpetual story of, of doom and gloom. And, it, and that actually is something that, you know, as we go through the 80s with this, with this podcast and the and the discovery of these things through the zap back to the, the zap to the past episodes, we'll see how you know this. There's a, a theme. Uh, it's like a thread, a golden thread that runs through all of that, and we'll pick that up. But it was like you say, the first time that a big global announcement of that kind had really hit the headlines because you know it was a hole in the ozone layer. At the end of the day, we you know we'd, we'd done something bad. Mm, absolutely, very bad. Um, so yeah, so that was it. I mean, I'm sure there's lots of other things going on. I think there was a, there was a big, big march or big sort of one of the big uh, marches in the Kremlin Red Square. They, they wandered past with all their ICBMs and what have you. There was that happened. Um, things were going on, obviously, but it, it, it there was a. I think as as Graham says, there uh, there was a lot of um, you know it was yeah it was the, it was the start of things changing and the start of us sort of realizing um, you know like I said we were 13 starting to realize sort of thing that you know our actions um spraying on too much brute uh, was damaging um damaging the ozone layer damaging yeah, the world who knew? No, we didn't know no we didn't <laughs> we didn't we were just we were sold a product to make us smell nice exactly yeah you know if i'd have known that you know using the uh the lynx africa would have actually destroyed parts of africa i would never have used it no <laughs> If my my mum had hair that was so solid, you could you know chip away <laughs> chip away at the ice in your freezer with it. She used so much hairspray. Yeah, same I think, with mine. I think, I think it was a can of go. Yeah, same with my mum. My my I'm hair. pretty convinced the red was mashed potato at one point. It, just, <laughs> it was like so, it was like solid mass. But you know, there you go. That's that, that's yeah. mum's fire. That's what they do. Yeah. What price <laughs> ozone layer? <laughs> okay. Anyway, uh, on that note, let's just progress into. Part two, let's get back to the games. All right, welcome back after that joyous news section. Um, let's move into some uh, joyous games. <laughs> yeah, maybe. All right, what we got first? Um, okay, first up <laughs> is the strangely titled uh, Bounty Bob Strikes Back. Yeah. Well, why strange? It's got a black guy called Bob in it. What's he striking back at? Yeah, well, is is this not a sequel? I thought this was a sequel to an original. Was it a sequel? Was it what what was was the first one? Was it just Bounty Bob? Bob? Yeah. Oh, there you go. Then I I really have no recollection of a game called Bounty Bob. I'm sure there probably was, but in this, Bounty Bob was striking back, and he was striking back in a pretty standard, um, pixel perfect, manic miner style platformer, single screen platformer, with some interesting touches. the, the, uh, some work and some don't. Like, it is perfectly perfect and it's very annoying. Sound effects are annoying. It's very easy to die by misjudging a jump because you think, oh, I'll land on that. No, no, you won't. Um, and then you'll just continue downwards in a horrible diagonal until you hit the floor <laughs> and die. Yeah. I'm sure you did that loads of times because I did it hundreds Many of times. times. So the main mechanic that you have to do in Bounty Bob Strikes Back is um, you have to touch or walk over every single part of every platform on the screen to progress it. So it's not a case of just collecting some items. You've got to get to every part of, ev- of, of, the, sing- of the screen, of every platform, and walk on it. This changes it to a solid colour from its like dash colour. Um, and once you've done that, you can progress to the next level. Um, some of the platforms are single squares. And you think, I can jump on that. And no, you can't. Oh, yes, you can. Only from a certain point. Who knows? Um, you there are some enemies walking around you pick up random objects that allow you to walk into them and kill them there are enemies that uh, that populate the level that you can kill by collecting a random assortment of objects um, that then turn them into things that you can just walk into and kill kind of pac-man like 
Um, and that's it, really. I mean, you you know, there's a teleporter on the very first screen, which takes you for, for no real reason. It teleports you to the top of the screen, where you then have to work your way down. Why not just start you at the top of the screen? I mean, unless teleporters come into it later sort of thing. I'm going to be honest. Um, the, the pixel perfectness put me off, and I couldn't get off the first screen um, because it was so, so tricky sort of thing, and it's so hard. Um and, you know, this had quite a decent reputation. People liked it. And I can see why it does add a few new elements to that Manic Miner style of, of single-screen platformer. Um, but it's just too goddamn finicky and hard. I mean, I felt exactly the same. This was I put this is very arcade-inspired. So it's inherited arcade sounds, and it's inherited arcade difficulty. Now, the problem with doing that on a home version is that no, the difficulty spike has to be something that you can get past. Uh, because otherwise, no one's going to get off that first screen. And I like you never made it off the first screen. Because of the complex and crazy sprite detection collision, which seemed completely... It, 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 it was inexplicable at times. So at certain, at certain points, it made sense. But like you say, you, you'd jump and suddenly you'd fly through a platform and you'd end up squashed. Or there was just... There was, it didn't make a lot of sense. Now, this is a bit of a throwback, I think, too. It felt like playing um, a game called Miner 2049er or Miner 49er, which was, an, which, was a, which was an old Atari game from many moons back. So there's some hints of that kind of that kind of game. And in fact, when you hit the enemies and you die, you, you sort of expand and contract and sort of die that way. That's straight from Miner 49er. So, th so I think this is basically a, a version of that. And it does have all of that kind, those kind of arcade-style tropes, but it is really annoying... And you have to really persevere with it and really want to persevere with it um, in order to get past. And I can't imagine how difficult Screen 2 is if Screen <laughs> 1 is that hard. There's 20 odd levels. Yeah, and, and the, thing is, the thing is, there's actually a very clear game arc in Bounty Bob Strikes Back. So it's not like some other games where it's like, there's, you know, there's going to be 100 screens. You are told from the get-go, there's this many screens, you've got to get through this many. The, the, the remit of the game is made clear. But you've got to get through those screens. And in what, with three lives... I would argue that, you know, uh, Impossible Mission is hard enough, but this is, that literally is literally, this is an impossible task. It's, it's something that even a hardcore arcade player of some standing would have trouble navigating correctly those levels, and I think. And it does have those hints of the, the Manic Miner kind of feel, but it lacks the kind of, you know, it lacks any kind of personality in that way. It just feels like an, it is an arcade game, essentially, so it's very arcade. And that comes with, you know, the ability to make you want to put 10 Ps in. Yeah, one thing I really did like, though, um, was the high score. The high score take that where you input your name um, with the two little things moving up left and right and pushing the things out and the space delete and then it all comes out. And then the way the high score table was displayed with the little birds picking up the letters and putting them and shifting all the scores around and everything. That, that was like, that almost made the game worth playing just to see that screen. So I thought that was, that was excellent and probably must have taken longer to program would have thought <laughs> than the actual game well they know you're gonna die going, a lot right <laughs> yeah but i was looking at it going, this is really clever so these little birds would pick your name up and they would if you were higher than the previous high score they would fly to that and move those letters down and it also as well if if your name was the same it didn't always move them around it was clever enough to know that it didn't need to swap that digit it could just put the new one in underneath it you're right um, I mean, it feels like there was two programmers <laughs> yeah 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 someone had a really cool high score system and they went oh just stick it on this game I'm like yeah but yeah i, I did enjoy that so I, I like to find the positives where i can um and in this it was simply getting a score so i could put some <laughs> high score in yeah there was that, <laughs> there was that moment when you actually achieved a score and like yes good yeah <laughs> and that was that but yeah, it's it's you know it is what it is sort of thing. I'm sure people, if you like, and I hate to say this phrase, if you like the sort of thing, you might like it. But it is just a, and I think Miner Forty Nine is a good call actually. Um, it does probably owe more to that than Manic Miner. Um, so yeah, you know, just I think it's worth a, worth a play just to do worth a play through two or three times well, just to get some scores on that high score and enjoy that. Well, exactly. Well, this, and as we'll discover, there are many games that come along that follow a very similar kind of rope oh, absolutely um, um, you know um, the, it's the early birth of platform games as such and they'd vary but at yeah. the end of the day these early ones like that are the kind of the early benchmarks and in actuality later on as we'll discover they 
the complexity of the tasks increases, but your chance of survival also increases because they realise that no one has fun. No one has any fun if you can't get off the first screen, right? So, yeah, nobody. So yeah, one of those. Um, up next, uh, let's let's move along. Up next, we've got Tim loves cricket. Oh, right. does he? Was <laughs> does <laughs> he really? Tim? I don't know who Tim was. <laughs> I think Tim. Um, I, I think Tim Love is the person. It's Tim loves cricket. Oh, is there an apostrophe in there? Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> just, I just thought it was Tim. I thought it was Tim. I thought it was like Tim Brooke Taylor or something. Someone from the goodies. <laughs> I think, uh, I think, I think Tim, Tim Love Ma- was a cricketer. Timothy Mallet. <laughs> I thought it was Tim Love's cricket. To be fair, that might have made Tim? it better. Who's Tim? Oh, oh, that makes a lot more sense. And I feel really stupid um, for not noticing that apostrophe. Well, yeah, it'd be like anyway, Jeff so, Capes cricket. So, Wouldn't it be just Capes cricket is some game that, that Jeff plays? <laughs> so, Tim Love, it's his cricket game. <laughs> right, okay. That, that, that all important um, apostrophe is <laughs> it's, it's not actually changed my uh, thinking on the game though because it's it's ass <laughs> and it's um, although my, my first statement on this is amazing for all the wrong reasons um, because you play it and you just and I think at one point it says do you actually want to play cricket which is a question I'm like well what else am I going to do this is a cricket game um, but then it starts, and he goes, do you want a bat, bat, a bowler? I chose to bat, um, which then treated me to the animation for the bowler. Um, and I've never seen anything like it. Um, I, I don't know whether my computer was running it fast or something like that, but there was two frames of animation running at such a pace that I don't know what was wrong with this bowler. Um, but it's, it, 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 could you describe it? I, I'm... Yeah, the word you're looking for was <laughs> crap. <laughs> It's these two frames that flick together so fast that it's supposed to look like you know someone running from behind, but then as, you, as, you, as they get near to the, the crease to do the bowl, it freezes into one frame of animation, and they skid to the they skid to the crease and bowl. And then the ball comes towards you, and you're the crappiest batter ever. Who I don't know where I, don't, I come back, <laughs> um, and I, I got I moved forward at one point, and it went to the fielding, and then I couldn't see what was going on, and it just went, oh, you've run out. Like, what what did I do? I didn't I didn't done anything. <laughs> so I was just yes. di- uh, garbage. Utter utter garbage. Um I Absolutely. mean cricket games obviously were unusual probably and you know Tim Love was probably happy to get some money from this. Um but oh god, dreadful. Yeah. Just I mean, dreadful. Uh, I put uh, in my uh, notes for this Tim may never love cricket again. <laughs> After he sees this horrific monstrosity, it felt like it had been. Uh, it felt to me like it was one of those that we spoke about earlier. This was. I felt like it was typed in, like from a magazine. Like somebody. This was like a listing that someone typed in and released. Yeah, and um, didn't realise they've got lots of date checksum errors. Yeah, and, <laughs> with and, yeah, exactly. Somehow it ran, but nobody knows how. It felt to me like the, whoever, if you like cricket, you would never want to play this game because it's not something. It, I thought it would make cricket. If if there's anything that can make cricket worse, and I'm not a cricket fan, but. I get that people like it, but this is just something that would take that experience and ruin it in every possible way. Um, it, it felt like it had. The, it felt like it was written in BASIC, which I think it probably was actually. Um, so it had that because there was no way that was machine code that was running that. It didn't have the vibrancy and the and the fidelity and the and the speed of machine code. It, this was something that was, I'm pretty sure, was written in BASIC, and that might mean that it was written by some 14 year old kid. Who you know, some fourteen-year-old savant cricket fan who thought you know who loved Tim Love, uh, and thought you know I'm going to make a cricket game about you know, and the, and you could choose it. You could do all the things you should be able to do in cricket: choose your team, bat, bowl, field, whatever. But you know, unless you really, really like cricket, you are going to hate this game because as soon as you see that bowler, such as he is, appear, and then you know, go through what can only be described as a painful episode and experience of, of some kind of torturous um fit um in order to throw the ball uh it just it just felt you know why would you do that you know it would have been better to not have that and just go the bowler has thrown the ball you know in some kind of text no and as if to, you know te- even the idea of a text-based cricket game but that, that makes me shiver with with horror um, <laughs> it would be nothing compared to that sequence where that bowler 
inexplicably left right his way across the screen and somehow threw the ball in the right direction and my batter as with yours just <laughs> went no you missed I'm thinking yeah. well you know I, di- I mean I, I, I actually chose to auto choose the team at the beginning because you can choose to name it which would have taken far too long in that process mm-hmm. I chose to just sort of let it pick the names but it, it, what it did was not just pick the names pick the worst batting side in known <laughs> cricket history because these guys didn't move they just kind of stood there while this but then again, I think to myself, if this was a real cricket match and you were ready to bat and you stood at the crease with, you know, and then, and then you see that thing running towards you, <laughs> you know, this blur of blocks flies towards you and just hurls a ball at you. You think, ah! And you wouldn't know what to do. So I think you would be frozen in terror. So maybe, in actuality, it's a very accurate description of what would happen if a cricket batter <laughs> was terrified beyond the capacity for rational thought. And if that's the case, if it's a cricket terror simulator, it was very good. Absolutely, that's actually capacity. made me... It's a cricket game, bad. <laughs> that's actually made me reconsider my thoughts on Tim Love's cricket. Uh, yeah, I also like how your answer to making anything better is to make it text-based. <laughs> if this was a well, text... In that turn, instance... turn a knob, make it text-based. Just make them text-based. <laughs> Elite, just have them flying around space. Just, you have flown to space. <laughs> well, don't... don't, don't have... you, you, have, you have hit a car. <laughs> Just Everything don't have the complexity text-based. unless you're ready. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> but in this instance, I would take out the cricket bowling in Elite. Don't make me dock. You know, don't make me do that. And in these other games, you know, turn and off. Don't make it happen. Just switch it off. As you said, turn it off. Yeah, turn and off. Turn it off. But um, <laughs> in this particular instance, I, I put Tim doesn't love cricket and he certainly doesn't know what cricket's about. Um, in fact, it, I would argue all he knows really is that there's a ball and a bat involved and there's something in between which for me looked like a, a wasp that had been squashed and thrown across <laughs> the screen so it's I just not put, good. No, horrible was my last word on that game <laughs> horrible yeah 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 not it wasn't yeah tim no no cricket <laughs> no no let's move on <laughs> let's move on to something which is just as impenetrable as cricket. Uh, Super Huey. <laughs> so Super Huey's from Paul Norman. I didn't know Paul Norman yes, made this. Okay. Uh, hot hot yes. the heels of Forbidden Forest. Um, he turns his. Uh, we got another helicopter game. Um, two helicopter games in one in one episode. Who, who would think that the Commodore 64 was replete with helicopter games? Well, here you go. Here's your second. This is very very different to uh, Airwolf. No caves. Um, and, and in fact, <laughs> in fact, when I played it, no flying because I couldn't, yeah, I no could purpose, barely get off yeah. the floor. <laughs> um, Super Huey. Um, so you're essentially it's, it's more like a simulator. So you're in in the cockpit of a Super Huey, um, which is you know a, a combat helicopter from you know the American Army, um, and you are given control of it. And the way you control it is by uh, uh, writing a series of three letter codes. <laughs> Just when you thought the Ternanog <laughs> ruled the roost on inexplicable control systems, then you come across Super Huey. <laughs> yeah. Okay, this 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 does undermine your argument that turning everything into a text adventure makes it better. Um, because this is essentially a text adventure helicopter sim. <laughs> Um, and it didn't make it better. No. Um, and and coming from, I mean, it's got some nice visual, you know, visually it's okay. The interior looks all right sort of thing. It, but... I don't know whether, you know, on the back of Forbidden Forest, he was like, it's a strange one to go to. Haunted Forest, you know, hardcore sim of an American chopper. I can't see I can't see the through line, um, but it is what it is. Um, it's, yeah, turn, it, they were experimenting clearly with, um, you know, control systems of what would work, trying to get around a single joystick and a button. Um, but three, three word commands that you had to remember? No, 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 <laughs> like, no, what? no. No, I could remember we- POW for power. Um, uh, and then if you typed them wrong, you still had to keep typing until you got back to the start of the three letters. It's, it, it's, it, it's a confusing mess of a, of a thing. And again, inexplicably, got a sizzler. Yeah, now there's a couple of things to note there. One, how did that happen? And how was were, one of the commands, were they, I think. Were they, well, <laughs> it was, yeah. Were they playing the same game? I don't understand maybe not i don't know uh, for me what made me laugh most of all and if you go right back as soon as the the opening sequence of the game which has got this kind of really stirring music <laughs> score 
And it's yeah. really kind of... It's got, like, opening credits for this game, like this superhero graphics kind of spin on and fly off in some, you know, in, in, a, in a very early blocky motion graphics kind of sense. It has a it has a title sequence for a game. Okay, I get that. And a, and a Huey helicopter-ish kind of flies up <laughs> and there's a pilot in there. It's all very, you know, winky faced. I'm in a helicopter pilot. And then it takes ages to load after that. So that's, that's one load of stuff. Now, 64Ks worth of intro happens and goes away. Then the game starts and you're presented with the cockpit and it's like, right, blah. <laughs> and you've got the controls and it's like, okay, so I've got to start the engine. So that's PPT. Then I've got to, you know, well, fuel, F, P, 6. And it's just, what on earth made, <laughs> made him think that that, instead of just pressing the fire button on a joystick and up, wouldn't yeah. be the best way to start that game. And I get that it's a, you know, it's going for simulation, but I'm pretty sure that there is not in every Super Huey helicopter in the world a QWERTY keyboard, <laughs> which means that's how you fly it. And I'm, and I'm pretty sure of that. So why that control system? And that's what really frustrated me. I felt this had the, the makings of something, and I don't like flight simulators, let's be honest. So I felt that maybe it was a, Maybe it was more shooter. The intro kind of sold it as a kind of a shooting game. So maybe it had that logic about it. But I never managed to get it in the air for more than a second before exploding. Which which is, you know, and I think that's probably because I pressed the wrong key combo. My feeling was every time I must have pressed the explode the helicopter in desperation key code. Yeah. But I I mean, why? Think, why do that? If you think about it sort of thing, there was, there was what was the control? There was, what, 20-odd commands or something like that? There are more than you know, 40 keys on that keyboard. You only need to assign each key to a command. I don't need to type in POW for power. Just press the P button. <laughs> well, this is press it, but the I, P. Think, I think that was what he was, he was aiming for. Complex simulation. So, and I think that's what he was aiming for. So it needed to feel complex to launch that, because helicopters are complicated. You know, you've, in a helicopter, you've got two joysticks yeah, yeah. all the time. You've got, you know, you've got obviously you've got your up and down and you've got your left and right or rotate and all the rest of it. No, I'm not a helicopter pilot and I probably just insulted every helicopter pilot in the world by saying <laughs> it's those two things. But my understanding is that it, it, it is complicated to fly a helicopter. But if you're making a game about play, flying a helicopter, the whole point is that you don't over simulate. And by doing that, ruin the experience of what could have been quite interesting. And I, even when you got off the ground. Um, and I checked out some YouTube videos of, because I couldn't actually get much further than an explosion off the ground. So I checked out some videos of the game playing. And it, it, you know, you do take off. You've got a kind of a sky ground view. There are sprites in there that kind of, you can, you know, go left and right in the screen. You know, pictures and yours. And that kind of way you would expect a helicopter to do. And you've got the sound effects and all the rest of it. And I don't doubt that there's a lot of programming prowess involved in to make that happen in that kind of way in this at this time. And it's ambition to make a, a simulator of an aircraft is is in 1985 is is crazy and um, and as we'll discover later down the line you no know, this is something that would repeatedly come back into the c64 and video games this idea of simulating something in it, it sort of it reaches its apex with things like gunship and things like that but um you know this is an early version of an attempt at that so i applaud the attempt but I think, you know, if you're going to do this, you've got to make these games penetrable. And these 80s, 1985 games, this list, they all suffer from that similar problem. They seem to suffer from being impenetrably. And like you say, I think they were just experimenting with controls. I think you're right. I think that's a, a really salient point. I think they didn't quite have it right. And this one has it wrong so badly that, it, you know, I, I've never flown a Super Huey helicopter and I'm still never going to be able to, you know, never. No, not with those controls. If I got into a Super Huey and there's a, and there's a keyboard in front of me and it said type three letter commands in and I would take everything back. <laughs> yeah. Everything. Oh, wait, wait, you know. I know this. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, it'd be like the girl in uh, Jurassic Park. Yeah, yeah. It's a this Unix is, system. It's a Unix system. I know this. P-O-W. <laughs> Power. It makes sense. <laughs> but I was the thing. Why wouldn't up just be U-P? Up. And if you're in a helicopter. Because th <laughs> it's not three letters. <laughs> What just seemed, you know, up, I suppose down would have to be, you know, it down. just seemed odd. But you've got cursor keys on a Commodore 64 keyboard, so that, for me, would be up and down. <laughs> you know what? 
Don't leave the controls to me, a novice. Yeah. You super Huey pilot. <laughs> leave it to the experts who make these games in 1985 to, to make sure I know. It's the same logic that makes cricket impossible to enjoy anyway, even though this is the same way. Flying a helicopter is so difficult, put me off for life. Never want to be a cricket or a, a helicopter pilot again. And so making it a text adventure did not work. <laughs> Can you imagine a helicopter flight simulator no, as no. a text adventure? <laughs> up, you are now up. <laughs> down, Hover. you have gone down. Hover, you are hovering. Hover. <laughs> your <laughs> rotate left you can see more off the left than you did when you didn't rotate left I mean, how would you describe that you are rotating yeah. stop rotating you have stopped <laughs> stop propellers stop. Stop. bad <laughs> bad stop. idea anyway, not... enough <laughs> yeah. you have stop crashed stop playing <laughs> you have crashed yeah. yeah literally right so yeah Super Huey uh So yes, Super Huey. No, nope, nope, nope. Uh, right, what we got next on our list? Uh, a few more before we hit media. So let's move on to uh, Cauldron. I like Cauldron. Tell us why. So, in a, it's okay. So it's a bit of a combination of two things. It is. It there is. A, there is faults. I'm not going to say there isn't. But at the same time, it looks different it looks like a nice game there's a there's an atmosphere and a feel to cauldron which is which is something that gets picked up in its sequel later but there's a feel to it there's a nice atmosphere to the game um it is hard crazy hard to do and and that part is is perhaps its its main failing is that it's it's ridiculously difficult but you know it, it's got some really great atmosphere sound its music is good it sounds good the graphics are really nicely drawn it's it's you know it's backgrounds when you're in the main part where you're the witch flying through and you got the, the sort of the you have to go into the caves and stuff like that which is kind of a shoot up really those parts are really good it is quite hard to fly and land um and then you're in the caves and again you're kind of in the almost in the sort of bounty bob territory with the sprite you know collision being precise but I quite like Cauldron. I quite like that Cauldron series of games. There's a there's a lineage to it and an atmosphere, and it's something a little bit different. It's how I imagine Attic Attack and those Spectrum games should have been done on a Commodore 64 in terms of the way the graphics look and the feel of it. It's a Palace game, and Palace had a really good tradition of doing, as we'll discover later down the line, some really great games. So I think it had it was the beginning of a, a good heritage for them. But it does have that difficulty spike, and that is, you know, it does make it. That's the one thing that really sets it back and mars it, I think. But other than that, it's a pretty, quite a pretty looking game. What I don't remember what review it got on Zap actually. I can't remember. The, uh, who was, uh, who was a sizzler, sizzler. I it? Sort of has that kind of sizzler look, <laughs> but, but yeah, it is. Yeah, but it's not a sizzler um, in the sense that you know you're gonna if you've got to really persevere with Cauldron, I think, and get good at it. Um, and I'm mm. not sure how good you can ever be at it, really, but. Yeah, that's my take. What about you? Yeah, no, I, I think I, I, I'd echo most of that. I think it's, it is it is very pretty looking. It's unusual looking. It's got an unusual setting. It has, uh, you know, influences from something like Defender, um, you know, and it's side-scrolling left to right. You can flip back and forth. Um, and, 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 you know, the introduction of the weird platforming sections is quite nice, That being a witch. And the, the landscapes are really nicely drawn. The scrolling's nice and smooth. Uh, you know, like you said, I think Palace have a reputation for knocking these kind of games out, and they would continue to do so with Holden 2, Antiriad, Barbarian, Rib Runner, I think, or all these kind of games that came from them sort of thing. Had a, they had a particular look. Um, I think they had a really good um, central sort of artist and music, musicians, and I think they had a good, a good sort of solid base around them. It is far too hard. It's too finicky to control. Um, it's never particularly easy to to you know things flying at you to control shooting up down and centrally um and so and to land that it, and it's it, it's controls let it down uh, which is a thing i think we see at this point in time as we've mentioned already um that it, it, it a tighter control scheme would have benefited this game hugely and i think made it into something really quite special because i think it is it isn't it is a really nice looking game but it just it, it it's like they just didn't quite nail that that the feel of what would come later and get say something like once you get control of it something like Whizball, um, where it feels tight and nice to control and it's got a bit of inertia and it feels good. It's just a bit lacking here, or it's something like Drop Zone, 
Um, Archie McLean's drop zone, I think, was much better. Um, this is that's what really just pulls this down slightly, sort of thing. But I'm all for the setting. I'm all for the visuals. I'm all for the atmosphere. Um, and I'm all for the way you know they've, they've tried to do something else with it. And you know, from your bog standard run of the mill arcade conversion, they've taken what were you know typical game tropes at the time and made it into something you know different. And I think quintessentially quite British as well. Yeah, and I think it the controls in their games plagued um, Palace. Um, yes, because, yes, you know, they did. They had a problem, you know. There was, and we'll, we'll come to this as we go through all of the various apps and we cover their games. But you know, th- th- this is not an isolated incident in terms of the Palace releases, and certainly not for Cauldron. But there's other games as well that suffer, uh, and they have that. Also, a lot of the games have that really weird difficulty spike about them as well. Um, yeah, but that said, yeah, um, I agree with you. Um, there's a look about their games; they look really nice. There's you know, you've got really well-defined graphics and sprites. You've got really nice... They always have an opening sequence, so the, the game feels like it has a beginning and a start, and, a, and it sets the pace and the atmosphere for the game. Um, and there's little little animations in the game that do that, so when you land, you know, and you can go in your cottage and you can steer the car. And all those little things that those games do, that we kind of, you kind of take for granted now in games that they have those kind of sequences, but back then... That what they're classed as are really they are like mini little cutscenes, even though they're very very rudimentary. That's what they are, and and you know and it sticks out. And I think that's in a in a sea of because as we saw in the previous podcast, there's a there's a sea of games out. There's hundreds of games out. Now we've just looked at the ones that made it into Zap, obviously, but there's loads of them made that never made that made it because they were kind of not very good or anything else. So there's a lot of stuff going on. It's a standout. You need it to be. Now, if you take out the license conversions in the arcades, you needed to have a thing. And Cauldron had that thing, even if it was just a witch and she was on a broom and you know, there was a there was a it had its own its own world, its own gameplay, its own um space. It created that kind of world. And because it, it had its own game world and its own game logic, albeit crazy difficult, it made a lot more sense and it felt like a, a much more um a comprehensive game. It felt there's a, there's a similar game experience on the BBC Micro, weirdly enough. Not the same as Cauldron, but there's a game called um, Citadel, which, again, is a game that's rudimentary in graphics, but is in its own space, has its own world logic, and because of that, makes sense in that. And Cauldron does make sense in, in its own game world. You just have to accept that you're going to die a lot when you play that game, because it's so hard. <laughs> but. That, yeah. Yeah, that is true. But, but I think it, it, I think it owes a little bit to the Ultimate Games. There's these hints of Ultimate Games about the Cauldron and the Palace games. The way you shoot, it feels very much like Attic Attack and very much like those kind of games. The way you sort of press the button directionally, shoot your you know, sort of spells when you're flying through the air, and, and that kind of that kind of the way that you you can take damage from things and stuff. You know, it, those those are hints of other games that have led to that. Um, but uh, it's an achievement in programming as well on a Commodore 64. It stands head and shoulders above some of the other games that we've looked at in terms of its graphics. And when we spoke earlier about, you know, turn our rubbish and the graphics that were just ported from a Spectrum, and then if you compare that side by side to the graphics that are in Cauldron, you know, you can see there is a core difference between the, the colourful screens and graphics of the medium res and that bin- binaural monochromatic colour style that, style that elides all of that. So... For me, it's it's a great game, but marred by its difficulty. But that is something that is going to come back to haunt them. Mm, yeah, I think spot on. Yeah, good stuff. Yeah, I think you're right. It's all right. It's okay. But yeah, too yeah, hard. Way too hard. Yeah. <laughs> As yeah. ever. I knew it was. Um, right. Yeah. So Cauldron, uh, sort of a, a, a partial thumbs yes. up. Yes. <laughs> we don't get no, many of them tonight. No. <laughs> this one. No. Shadow Fire um, and Cauldron right. so far are the two that stick out. <laughs> yeah. And we're not going to get another one right now. <laughs> And there we go. That's the end of part one uh, for issue one. Uh, we've looked at Elite, Spy Hunter, Pole Position, Airwolf, Turner Nog, Bounty Bob, Tim Loves Cricket, Super Huey, and Cauldron. Um, as I'm sure you will agree, some much better than others. Uh, some disappointments, some eye openers. Um, and I'm sure it'll just carry on like that. In our next uh, episode, we'll be carrying on. Uh, reviewing games and looking at games on that first from May 1985 um, we'll be looking at games such as Gimme Regards to Broad Street Lords of Midnight uh, Penetrator uh, and Book Rogers uh, along with some others as well 
um, it yeah it don't get very good um, so expect um, many levels of uh, awful in the next part um, I've been Adrian Mills I've been joined by Graham Raddings um, thanks for listening to Zap to the Past and we will catch you next week thank you for listening to the Zap to the Past podcast we hope you enjoyed our deep dive into the world of Commodore 64 games, as well as the music, sights, sounds and news from around the 1980s, driven, of course, by the issue of Zap 64 magazine published at the time. We will be back next week with another podcast, so do please join us. Until then, please head over to zaptothepast.com to sign up to our email list, as well as check out all the links and resources in the show notes. You will also find us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram under Zap to the Past. The Zap to the Past podcast is written and produced by Adrian Mills and Graham Raddings and recorded at Flaky Bits 2.0 Studio. All opinions expressed are those of the writers and while we indeed love the Zap 64 magazine, the Zap to the Past podcast is not affiliated with it in any way. Stay safe and see you next time.